only they couldn't believe what was happening. They froze and they looked up at that time. What, you know, what's going on here? And then wham, uh, they're hit. Robert Boyer, a professor of mathematics who was due to take a position at Liverpool University in the autumn, lay dead on the South Moor. You have a man on top of the competition. They're pretty bad. Need an ambulance in. Thomas Ashton, who was attending a course before starting volunteer work in Iran, lay mortally wounded. Four minutes after Whitman opened fire, Austin police started to arrive. We've got a shooting. Uh, I don't know the details as yet. But we got all the units going out there this subject on power with rifles. More than a hundred city policemen, the Highway Patrol, and Texas Rangers began to converge on the campus. At first, it was not clear what tactics to use against the sniper. Charles Whitman had everybody pinned down. But eventually, the bravery of a few officers would end the carnage. In August 1966, gunfire from the top of the clock tower on the campus of the University of Texas had law enforcement officers and the university population running for cover. One of the first City of Austin policemen to arrive was Houston McCoy. I looked up there and on the north end there was one shot. Then right in the middle there was a shot and then, there's, then on the south end there was a shot. Whitman had positioned weapons on every side of the tower shooting from east, west, north, and south. He gave the impression that there was more than one sniper. I thought there was at least three of them right there, you know. It was a time of uncertainty in America. The thing that hit my mind, it was all these political factions going on and everybody saying they're gonna rebel against America and all this stuff, and then uh, just thought that this might be the time the revolution had started, you know. Radio reporter Neil Spels was one of the first newsmen on the scene. You know, as you drive up to the campus, you hear sirens, you hear bullets, you see people running, you see people screaming, and uh, so I started broadcasting right away. This is Neil Spells and Red Rover on the University of Texas campus. This is a warning to the citizens of Austin. Stay away from the university area. Traffic is now converging on this area, and there is a sniper on the university tower firing at will. Patrol officer Jerry Day responded to the emergency shortly after the shooting began. And the first thing I saw was two young ladies, about 17, and they were shot down. One of them apparently was still alive, but in terrible shape. Her whole chest was blown out. He is definitely under the clock on the south side, and police are returning the fire at the sniper. There's no report as to who this man may be, or what he's doing up there, or what prompted this apparent madness. I just knew I had to do something. I mean. You see, you see those bodies laying everywhere, and this got to be stopped. As the bloodshed continued, people risked their lives to try and rescue the wounded and dying. Rand, how many have you gone out to rescue? Today, two. What did you have to do? Run hard and keep low. Did you have any trouble getting them up, or uh, did any shots come close to you while you were out there? No shots came close to me. It's just the last one. He was dead. He was dead weight. He was a little hard picked up, too limp. Not like someone was knocked out. How many have you seen that are dead today? Just one. I hope not anymore. Cliff Drummond spotted one victim slumped against a parking meter. Not moving at all. And it was clear that there was some blood around uh, his uh, face and, and neck. He and another student made a dash into the line of fire to help him. Uh, we took off. Uh, and it was then that, uh, without hearing any shots, I had a very definite uh, understanding that the pavement was exploding around us. We picked this young man up, who had obviously been shot in either the throat or in the mouth, and a car came racing down the drag, saw that we were there, and it screeched to a stop. They opened the back, uh, we picked the young car, and they roared off south down the drag. Thirty-five minutes into Whitman's massacre, eight people lay dead, and seven more had been wounded. This was a huge scale that was uh, unfolding before us, and it was real and it was deadly. 
There were a lot of people down, a lot of people that we knew were dead. We didn't have any idea how many, and a lot of blood in a lot of places. Charlie Whitman turned his blistering fire on the businesses of Guadalupe Street with deadly effect. Recent high school graduates, Paul Sontag and Claudia Rutt, were both shot dead. A teenage paperboy was picked off while riding his bike. Forrest Priest was running down the street, moving quickly to his right, when something made him stop. In approximately 10 seconds after that, a very high power rifle bullet came past my right ear and it hit a gentleman named Harry Walchuk who was standing inside a little newsstand in my right. Harry Walchuk, a PhD student and father of six, died later in surgery. I saw a wounded man out in the middle of Waterloo Street in line of fire and he's just sitting there and he's holding his arm. And I told him, I said, get up, get out of here. He, he said, what I do, what I do? This was the question of the day for everybody. Anyway, I, took, I went over to the uh, middle of the street and I stood him up and put him behind a tree. There was this odd feeling that ran through my head uh, several times. How long can this go on? How long can this continue? Yes, there are people shooting back at him, but how are they going to get to him? The former Marine in his citadel had the citizens of Austin in his sights and its policemen at bay. There seemed to be only one way to end it. I just thought he was in a fort. There's only got one way. We had to get in that fort with him. In his fort on top of the University of Texas clock tower, Charles Whitman listened to the reaction to his mayhem on a transistor radio. It's a battle now. It's a battle between the sniper and the police. It started out as a one-sided affair with a man picking off targets from a good distance away. He was very militarily inclined. He had the whole program set up for himself. He was in a killing field, and he was the killer. And uh, we found out later that he he'd left a note that he was going out to kill the pigs. And he, he considered everybody uh, a pig. He had shot people who were either running or moving. He was actually a better marksman with a moving target than he was with a stationary target. Whitman's marksmanship was stunning. He shot and killed Roy Schmidt, an electrician who had taken cover with some reporters 500 meters away. We just saw Papa Smokey fired again. The police carried only 38 caliber pistols and shotguns, none of which had the range to reach Whitman in the tower. An aeroplane with a police marksman aboard was flown over the tower to bring him down. But as the plane approached, Whitman fired at it. But Whitman is sitting there on top of that with a place to rest his arms and look up at that plane and fire a shot. And that plane got out of there quickly or it would have crashed because he could have brought the plane down. His marksmanship allowed him to bring down a policeman. There has been a report of a policeman that has been shot. When I looked down, I saw Billy Speed, Officer Billy Speed, get, get hit right up here in his right shoulder. The shot that killed police officer Billy Speed was placed through an opening no more than this far, maybe six inches apart. And he, from the top of the tower, shot down between uh, those two supports on a railing and went right through there and hit Billy Speed with a fatal shot. He was the only officer killed that day. He, he sort of, in some strange way, prophesied that death. An hour into Whitman's massacre, the body count stood at 11 dead and 20 wounded. Outgunned, police officers and civilians went home to retrieve their own high-powered rifles. The whole community turned out as like a militia out there. I mean, they were after this guy. They didn't know either how many were up there. Nobody knew really what it was at the top. As increasing numbers of armed civilians fired at the tower, the sniper himself was pinned down. Firepower from downstairs kept him under those walls, and it found out his plan went to mock right there. It just really stopped him. But the police were struggling too. Back in those days, we did not have communications. We did not have handheld radios. And once the policeman was out of his car, he was on his own. 
And what I was trying to do is find someone from the police department that could tell me, hey, do we have a plan or this is what we're doing?